This video is brought to you by Nebula. After months of growing political unrest, on Monday the Croatian Prime Minister Andrei Plenković announced that his government would be dissolved before the 22nd of March, with new elections due to be held sometime before the European Parliament elections on June the 9th. These elections are seen by the opposition as a potential turning point in a country that's been dominated by Plenković's HDZ for over a decade now. So in this video, we'll explain why Plenković is holding early elections, what the key issues in the campaign may be, and what an opposition victory would mean for Croatia's political trajectory. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. First, let's start with some context. The centre-right HDZ, or Croatian Democratic Union, was founded by Croatia's wartime president Franjo Tudjman in 1990. It's one of the biggest political parties in Croatia, alongside the centre-left Social Democratic Party, or SDP. Between 1990 and 2000, HDZ were pretty nationalist in their policies, despite claiming to be a bog-standard centre-right Christian Democratic Party. Following the election of Ivo Sanader as party president in 2000, and who served as prime minister between 2003 and 2006, the HDZ adopted a more moderate position, which the current leader, Andrei Plenković, has continued ever since coming to power in 2016. However, in the past couple of months, there's been growing dissatisfaction among the Croatian opposition with HDZ and their policies, with many on the Croatian left accusing Plenković of staging an Orban-style attack on Croatia's democratic institutions and the rule of law. Anyway, as a result, last month 11 left-wing and centrist parties staged a joint protest in Croatia's capital, Zagreb, against Plenković, calling for immediate elections. The two biggest parties out of the 11 were the SDP and the progressive left-wing Green Coalition party, We Can. The latter dominated the Zagreb local elections in 2021, winning 40% of the popular vote, compared to the HDZ, which only got 11.3%, and is currently the main party in municipal government in the capital. Whilst Croatia's parliament, the Sabor, and the HDZ originally rejected the opposition's motion for its dissolution in late February, on Monday Plenković made a screeching U-turn, announcing that elections would be held before the European Parliament elections on June the 9th. From Plenković's perspective, he's probably thinking that an HDZ victory would be a good way to shut the opposition up and give him a mandate for his more controversial policies. This is very possible, according to current polls, which suggest that the HDZ are by far and away the most popular party in Croatia at the moment, on about 33% of the vote. However, because Croatia uses a broadly proportional electoral system, this probably won't be enough for an outright majority, and the election could clearly still go either way. For their part, the opposition will be hoping that by focusing on two things, corruption and the cost of living, they'll be able to convince voters that it's time for a change. So let's start by looking at Croatia's apparent corruption problem. Croatia has a history of high-level corruption. Former Prime Minister Ivo Sanader, for instance, was found guilty of war profiteering and corruption, earning him a lengthy prison sentence of 18 years. Croatia currently ranks 57th out of 180 countries on Transparency International's Perception of Corruption Index. This makes it one of the most corrupt countries in the EU, ahead of just Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania and Greece. This issue came up in late February, after the HDZ appointed Ivan Turadic as Croatia's Attorney General, prompting the opposition to request the dissolution of the Sabal. For context, Turadic, a former judge, is quite a controversial figure in Croatia especially for the opposition. He's an admitted sympathiser with the HDZ, and has been linked to people either convicted or suspected of corruption, such as former State Secretary Josipa Plesic, who was arrested on suspicion of corruption in May 2020. Turadic also presided over several high-profile cases in Croatia, including the tax fraud case of former Dinamo Zagreb football club executive Dravko Mamic. Turadic was criticised for his handling of the case, and has been accused of bias in favour of Mamic, who's since fled to Bosnia. Turadic's appointment was described as the last straw by the opposition, which triggered the protests calling for early elections. 
In response, the HDZ accused the opposition and its supporters of being wild and angry revolutionaries and Russophiles. The government has also been accused of attacking media freedom, with a new law known as Lex AP, which would criminalise, quote, unauthorised disclosure of investigative or evidentiary acts, i.e. unfriendly journalism, with a maximum of three years in prison. This law was proposed after journalists got hold of WhatsApp messages between Plenkovich and the former minister for EU funds, Gabriela Zalak, who is under investigation for corruption. The opposition has made comparisons of Plenkovich's attacks on media and democracy to neighbouring president of Serbia, Aleksandr Vucic. As well as corruption, the opposition will probably also attack Plenkovich over Croatia's ongoing cost of living crisis. In 2022 and 2023, Croatia endured some of the highest inflation in the Eurozone, in part because Croatia only adopted the Euro last year, but the opposition has attacked Plenkovic for not doing enough to support ordinary Croatians, and have advocated for inflation indexing public sector salaries and pensions. While inflation has come down from a high of about 14% to about 4% today, that's still pretty high. And because Croatian inflation has been driven by food prices, it's hit the poorest hardest. Similarly, while the Croatian economy posted steady GDP growth of about 4% in 2023, GDP per capita is still only about half the EU average. And the opposition argue that this growth isn't down to the government, but rather the influx of European funds and an over-reliance on tourism. But perhaps the main issue for Croatia's government and the economy is that even steady GDP growth hasn't been enough to stem the exodus of young Croatians out of the country. Whilst depopulation is a chronic problem in most Balkan countries, Croatia's own exodus has worsened since it joined the EU and the Schengen Zone. More than 250,000 Croatians have left since it joined the bloc, and Croatia's population has declined by about 20% since its peak in the 90s. A lack of young people also means fewer babies, and Croatia now has a fertility rate of about 1.4, which means its population will continue to shrink in the future. All in all, 2024 is due to be a politically momentous year for Croatia. Not only are there national elections due sometime in the next few months, but then there are going to be European elections in June and a presidential election in December. While polling suggests that the HDZ are still the most popular party in Croatia, they're less popular than they were in 2020, when they won over 37% of the vote, and the two largest opposition parties, We Can and the SDP, last Friday announced that they're starting coalition negotiations to maximise their chances of ousting Plenkovic and co. If they can turn things around, Croatia's political landscape could look very different in a year's time. If you want to keep learning and expanding your knowledge, then I'd recommend you check out Wendover Productions' brilliant series, The Logistics of X. You likely know Wendover already, but in this series they dive deeper into the logistics and operations behind everything from search and rescue operations to ski resorts and coal mining. One episode I think you'd particularly enjoy is their latest, which gets into the logistics of weapons manufacturing. Something that's key to a number of topics we discuss regularly in TLDR videos, and something that directly impacts wars and conflicts all around the world. It's a brilliantly researched and thorough series, and it's exclusively available on our streaming service Nebula. As you likely know, Nebula is the service we built with a bunch of our creator friends, and is the home to tons of smart educational content from all of your favourite creators. The best part is that by signing up, you not only get access to exclusive series like The Logistics of X, Modern Conflicts from Real Life Law, or China Actually from Polymatter, it also directly supports TLDR. That's because when you sign up, you contribute to the budgets of these big budget documentaries and help us grow and expand our ambitions. If you want to get more superb context and support TLDR, then if you sign up using the link below, you can support us directly and get Nebula for 40% off their annual plan. That's less than £2 a month. Thanks for your support and for backing Nebula.